you know, I wasn't really interested in the Lynx power circuit in particular. Uh, I took a look inside of my Lynx 2 because I redid the display and capacitors and uh, they typically replace a FET and a diode, so then I took an interest in why you do that. Since the last video, this unit has got the Ben Ven screen update. I mentioned it's not worth making a video for what already exists out there. It's important to keep up to date though, because this has been changed over time. Um, so one of the videos I watched you had to connect a wire, even though this is essentially solderless, so there was a wire you had to connect between the keypad membrane connector on the circuit board and the Ben Venn display board to make brightness work, and that's no longer the case. It's actually solderless, uh, and the brightness works. If you want scan lines to work, you have to solder a, uh, a wire now, um, and then the backlight button will alternate scan lines artificially on the display, but I didn't bother connecting that, so backlight does nothing. Brightness works. And it's a neat upgrade. Now that I see it, I'm very tempted to do the same to the Lynx one. I used to play this on a Sony PSP emulator, and this display looks better than a PSP did. Here's the Lynx power supply section of the schematic which runs along the bottom of either schematic really for either model there's slight differences between them the buttons are included in the schematic for the Lynx one uh, and the Lynx 2 they just run off as separate lines that catch up at the top of the schematic with the keypad membrane I'll begin with what I've omitted which is everything to the left of the battery uh, because I'm not too interested in replicating the AC power adapter switching but uh, we've, this will be a common mode choke here for relieving some interference on this uh, power cord. Uh, a resistor divider will produce a voltage which is suitable to feed into the controller. That'll be Mikey or Hiato, which uh, indicates to the links that it is connected to AC. The controller also outputs the state of uh, power. So when you lash the power on, the controller sets this pin to keep power on, which means that at some point it is able to power itself off. I don't know if that functionality is ever used, um, but the Lynx hardware can be told to turn itself off. Maybe if you don't input into it for a long time and it's running off batteries. But anyway, I've done the rest. Well, it's about time to power this thing up, wouldn't you say? I think it's obvious that this light bulb represents the rest of the load that your Lynx presents to this power supply. Hang on a minute. Ah, well, if you're watching the last video, it's like the, the positive supply rail is routed straight through a game cartridge and back into the unit to power this chip. Remember, it's a single chip on the real links and two chips here. So my simulation of inserting a game cartridge is just inserting a couple of jumpers that will power uh, this chip. So now it's time to turn the unit on. Hang on. Damn it. I know I mentioned that I've taken an interest in the Comlinks cable in the previous video and I've taken steps towards investigating that. This really elicits the difference between the two displays and still it's hard to bring myself to change this one. The Lynx 1 does sound better, it's got a bigger speaker uh, and the sound on it just sounds um, fuller. I like the joystick on this better, or the way that it works, the joypad with a membrane and separate rubbers. It could be considered that this circuit is split in two by this FET Q11. That's where the ground side of the circuit supplied by the battery becomes dereferenced on the regulated side of the circuit. 
on the regulation side of this circuit, a reference voltage is provided by the circuitry to the right of my hand here. This Zener regulator could provide a current to power a small circuit on its own, something like one IC and a flashing LED. For something like the Lynx, it can't do all of the work. It controls the switching of this FET at high frequency through a series chain of inverters that results in total in a single knot gate. The whole idea is feedback from the reference voltage switches the FET to maintain uh, the Zena voltage on this capacitor here. Switching of this FET does heaps more of the work than the Zena and nothing heats up. Everything's good as long as that all works. Okay, now it's time to turn the unit on. I guess from now off, we'll be referring to on as off and off as on. My error in swapping the button on off labels comes straight from the Lynx 1 schematic. In the Lynx 2, the problem has been corrected, but on and off are swapped. In this case, the on and off buttons are let out to a keypad membrane that's connected at the top of the schematic. Let's go back to the latching side of this circuit and look at these two inverters here, both part of U6, both only powered when a gain cartridge is inserted. So the unit will consume slightly more power uh, when a gain cartridge is inserted and you know how much current and whether or not it's worth worrying about is up to you. Um, normally let's start with the default state where a high input is uh, switched to low through this knot gate, switched back to high again and fed back into a feedback loop through two series knot gates, which amounts to a nothing gate. This is a very low current loop due to the two 100K resistors. So not a lot of current is being wasted maintaining uh, this bi-stable latch. At power up, when you hold the on button, the first thing that happens when the supply regulates is the CPU will run an instruction, probably contained in its ROM, to turn on its power on pin and set it low. That'll uh, conduct a low through this transistor into pin 13 uh, directly. So it'll pull down no matter what the state of the feedback loop is uh, through this 1K resistor. Um, if it was high, it'll be pulled low. So the latch will now enter its other stable state of uh, low input, high, low, back into a, a low current feedback loop, which is low at this end. And that's why TP18 says uh, power on low. TP17, I think, is actually incorrect on this schematic, and it's also uh, another thing removed from, uh, from the <laughs> Lynx 2 version. Um, and that might have been something to do with swapping these two on and off labels. Other than that, the schematic is essentially correct. The Q4 transistor was implemented from the get-go, but now I've got a button to simulate the CPU, which is normally tied low through a resistor, but pressing it will set it high, which simulates the CPU letting the line go, or even letting go for any reason, losing its reference to ground. All the way back to the right hand side of the circuit to the Zena regulator, which I should be calling a Zena reference because it's really just a part of a larger switching regulator circuit. In order to understand it, you really have to get inside the minds of those who created it. When pondering what will happen if the Zena diode fails short circuit, pay attention to the 120 ohm resistor connected in series with it between the supply rail and the new regulated ground. All that really happened was we reset the latch, maybe because of what happened around Q4 again. When originally deciding how to lay out this board, I decided to use a pair of inverter chips 4069 instead of just one that the original circuit uses 
and that's to separate their duties into four units, four inverters used for regulation on this side of the circuit, which is roughly in line with the schematic, and two inverters to do with the latch. So across the two chips, there are six spare inverters and they're all just tied low to stop the chips in themselves going into oscillation and being destroyed potentially. Uh, the important um, overall thing to note about the circuit on a whole on both sides is the positive rail across the top is connected. It's always common between the regulated side and the latch side. It's the negative side of the rail that's split here and regulated on one side. There is a potential difference of a couple of volts, two or three volts across this FET. So you can run this LED from both sides of a power rail. That's just being powered from either side of a FET from two or three volts difference between both sides of this FET. Now let's short the potential across the FET with a pair of tweezers. Bearing in mind that this is a 6.3 volt incandescent lamp And bam, you can see the brightness increase there with voltage. At this point, the Zener will be trying very hard to do all the regulation, not very successfully and won't last very long. For the test, I haven't performed yet on or off camera. Not really sure what will happen, but cutting the Zener to simulate the Zener failing open. Well, again, Looks like we've got the entire supply voltage delivered straight out of the regulated output. Let's try and turn it off. I mean on. Well, it still works. It means everything here is getting over voltage, but well it isn't really because the 4069s are there and selected because they can tolerate up to 18 volts, double this battery supply voltage. The links on the other end of this can't. This is uh, an unregulated supply, but the latch is working nicely. At this point, I should talk about other ways that we can protect this circuit rather than just replace components that exist, such as a crowbar, for example. We could make a crowbar across the output with a TVS diode and then a fuse that will blow to protect the rest of the links. But anyway, all oh, that's a topic for another video. So this considers this for now. I can turn the soldering iron off. And uh, see you in the next video. I hope you enjoyed my video about the Atari Lynx power circuit. It would have been better if my house hadn't burned down. To be honest, it's going to take lots of likes and subscribes to pay for this. I managed to save my Atari Lynx and my phone, so I should be able to make more videos. But I'm going to have to live in a cardboard box. I'm going to live in a park next to a supermarket and be quiet at night to avoid rapists. Then in the morning, I'll get up and listen to the radio when it's safe in the daylight and I'll be able to go and get my day's groceries. I'll see you next time for another video from my cardboard box and probably about the Atari Lynx.